Okay, so first off, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Redmond, and actually, um, I was telling the one group over here that uh, there was a PhD nutritionist in the state of Oregon who asked me to go down to Redmond and pick up uh, the, he had a batch of special salt blocks made at Redmond. They had uh, four pounds of kelp pressed into the block and he wanted me to go buy those and sell them in the desert because he, on the west coast of Oregon, there's enough humidity that uh, the partnership between salt and kelp was rather interesting. Salt draws water to itself and kelp absorbed the water and as the kelp got bigger the block fell apart. And because of that accident or mistake that's the reason I ended up driving down to Redmond and that was my exp first experience with any Redmond product. Um, then I started learning from organic dairies what they were doing and what they saw and then I took it to conventional dairies and they reported the same findings and so that was enough to start to help me believe that what Redmond was telling me had some foundation to it and so that was seven years ago and and uh, there's been a lot of dairies a lot of cows benefit from the Redmond product and so we're going to talk a little bit about why First off, you may have recognized the logo on the far left. That is a logo that Redmond's had for 10 to 15 years. Recently, we had created this one called Red Edge because we started mixing the Redmond salt and the conditioner together in a product. And now we are going to make a change on you. So there is the new logo for Redmond. So you'll see that on my shirt. This is just barely coming out. Uh, the, the corporate logo is the, the word Redmond with that uh, crescent over the top of the word. And so that is being incorporated into all of the different parts of Redmond, whether it be the equine team or the deer team or the Redmond stores or uh, the ice melting products and so on. So we have a lot of different teams at Redmond and so that is going to be incorporated into all those. So it'll be kind of more pulling everything together. So with Redmond, it's a natural product. We really don't do anything with our salt other than we crush it. Um, the Redmond conditioner, and, but in Canada it has to be called Redmond anti-caking because the government does not allow us to use the same name in Canada as we use in the States. And so the, the clay product, the Montmorillonite clay, we simply crush it and use it in the product. So we have different screen sizes. So everything is natural and we feel that nature has it right because these two products are loaded with minerals and lots of trace minerals. We also keep it very simple. Um, some things get very, very complex out there in the mineral world. And we know that in ocean water that the mineral profile of ocean water is quite similar to the mineral profile of our blood. Whether it be us or dairy cattle or horses or deer or whatever kind of mammal, those mineral profiles are quite similar. So we can keep it simple because it was laid down or created that way. And so we think that the Redmond salt is a very, very unique product. When the oceans have dried up in different parts of the world, most of the time you end up with a sodium chloride crystal and then all the other minerals are in the ocean water layered out in different layers. There are four places in the world that when this happened, the crystal also had all the mineral in it. So there's four places in the world that the geologists have found that this very unique phenomenon happened, that all those minerals were captured in the crystal with the sodium and chloride. And so two of those places are in Europe, and one is in Pakistan, and there's one in Utah. And so that makes it very simple, but very unique. We also like to let you know that Redmond has its own farm. We have a dairy herd. We actually have some free range chickens and grass fed beef. 
and these products are all marketed through the Redmond stores. They're called Real Foods Markets, and now they're just changing the name to Redmond Heritage Farms. And so we are farmers. We do those things. Uh, many of the people who work for, at Redmond, particularly on the ag team, are farmers by nature. And so we're kind of very sensitive and empathetic to the situation of, of being on farms. So when we talk about the Redmond salt, we make it in several different uh, forms. Um, so we have the blocks, we have it in bags, we actually have it in uh, 2,000 pound tote sacks, and we have it in bulk. But from that, we have various products that we make. So you can see on the right there, we have uh, products for the horses. We have products for all the different uh, livestock that we might have on, on a farm. Um, there's some other products. This tube down in the lower center there is utter mud. That comes from the clay, the Montmorillonite night clay. We have a toothpaste line called Earth Paste. And so the base of that is the clay, and we don't have fluorides and all those other things in there and all these chemicals to whiten teeth and whatever. It is simply just uh, toothpaste with some mint flavor or lemon flavor, oils, and so on. We found out in Ontario, Canada, that the dairymen were taking the earth paste, the mint earth paste, and putting it on the udder of the cows. And it was drawing the swelling very well because the clay naturally draws swelling. And so we decided that we better not be trying to market toothpaste for the udder. So we decided we had, need to come up with a different product name and packaging, and it's called Utter Mud. So that's what the little tube is. So with dairy and the performance of dairy, we're going to go through and we're going to talk about what we're seeing and the performance and what we, we can actually measure scientifically. So on this slide here, this is a thousand cow dairy in the Twin Falls area of Idaho. And the gray bar uh, on first service there was when they were not feeding any Redmond product. Then the blue bar is when they were only doing it free choice. So the first year that they used Redmond, they only fed it free choice. Then the second year, they started putting it into the total mixed ration and also having some out free choice. And you can see what happened to, whether it be first service conception rates, second service, third service, and so on. Now this particular dairy had been written up in some of the dairy magazines as one of the top 5% reproductive herds in the United States before they went on to Redmond. And so that, that light gray bar is where they were at when they were in the magazines. And you can see that they've gone from somewhere around 36, 37% first service conception up to over 50%. And so that's one of the things that people really notice is with the Redmond salt and conditioner in the, the, the feed program, they get very, very strong heats. In some of the places where they have Tystall barns, they talk about vocal heats. They'll come in the barn in the morning and one cow will be in the front end of the barn and she'll be bellering and serenading the cow in the back end of the barn because they're both in heat and they're both singing to each other. They're in such strong heats. We'll talk also about some of that probably in the swine part about seeing sows show heat. So how well do the minerals in the Redmond Salt and Conditioner supply the body with the mineral needs that they, they have? So what we uh, learn from nutritionists and vets is that they wanted to see what the liver biopsy data was. So in the top, or on the left side there, you have different minerals. And so the top one is calcium. And the range in the liver should be between 30 and 200, and we were at 107, so we were right in the dead center. Now these, these dairies that were on this um, represents four dairies in the lower right there in blue. It says four dairies at 2,200 cows. Two of those dairies were in Pennsylvania. One dairy was in Idaho, and one was in the state of Washington. 
So those herds had to be on the Redmond salt and conditioner product for a minimum of 10 months before we would consider them eligible to see exactly what level the minerals are being supplied in the liver. So you look down through those 10, 11 different minerals and none of them were deficient. That was very, uh, that, that was a good feeling because we have some dealers in the states that they are going around saying this is the only thing you need in your mineral program. And so we needed to know what our risk was if there were some areas of default where we weren't covering the needs of the animal. And so this was very enlightening to see this. Now some of them are getting a little to the left side of the, the bar and actually one was a little high, but uh, that's an extremely good report card. If you hit 10 out of 11, that's over 90%. And it'd be very hard to do a formulated mineral program and be that uh, well represented in each of those minerals. As we talk to different nutritionists, um, we were telling people that the Redmond clay or the Redmond conditioner, uh, this Montmorillonite, was a buffer for the rumen. It would buffer the, the acid. And so their question to us was, what is the buffering capacity? Or in other words, how much acid can it buffer? So I, I called up a well-known uh, researcher in the, in the dairy circles, Mary Beth, and I don't say her last name quite right, Diordanza, something like that. She's in the New York State area. Um, and I said, Mary, where could I figure out the buffering capacity of our product? And she says, go to West Virginia University. They will be able to do that research for you. So what they do is they have side-by-side -side testing of, they had one fermenter getting bicarb and the other fermenter getting Redmond conditioner. And so the bicarb is the light blue or gray line and the conditioner is the, blue, the green line. And you can see the rate of decline uh, from, when you look across the, the, the bottom line there, the horizontal axis, you have hours of zero hours, two hours, four hours, and so on. At zero hours is when they fed the, the, the fermenter. And as soon as you feed the fermenter or feed a cow, it's about three hours after you feed them that the pH in the rumen is the lowest. And so you can see that it dropped down to just under six pH. And then it is... Uh, under 6 pH for just a couple hours and it starts to rebound and it starts to climb back up and so at 12 hours is when they do the second feeding and then it drops again. Now when we put this into the software program to do this it distorted the back half of that graph and that is because we go from single digits to double digits. So the recovery time on the second half of that graph is actually the same as the front half. Okay but you can see that it, those lines are so close to each other, it looks like you ran, ran the same product twice. So there is basically no difference in the buffering capacity of Redmond conditioner versus sodium bicarbonate. And sodium bicarbonate is kind of the standard of the industry to try and protect the rumen. So from the West Virginia University study, we found out more than just buffering capacity. We found out that bicarbon conditioner are equal. So they both get a check mark. But West Virginia also told us that the fermenters that had the conditioner in actually had better fiber digestion. The ADF, acid detergent fiber, the NDF, neutral detergent fiber, had better breakdown in the conditioner. They also showed that there was less buildup of ammonia in the rumen. Now, is that a so what, or is that something important? So what happens is when you feed a cow very soluble protein, it goes into the rumen and it converts over to ammonia very quickly. And then ammonia is easily absorbed through the ruminal wall and put into the bloodstream, and the bloodstream takes it to the liver, and the liver changes it from ammonia to urea. 
So on our milk report, we get a thing called milk urea nitrogen or MUNS. Anybody seen a MUNS report? So what does MUNS tell us? Well, one, it tells us that we probably have excess protein that we're being fed, so we're inefficient on feeding protein. We also learn that reproduction is drastically negatively affected if we get too much MUNS, too much urea in the blood. So the animal tries to get rid of urea because it doesn't want it in the body. So how is the first way that an animal tries to get, you to get rid of urea out of the bloodstream? It dumps it into the kidneys, and then what happens after you dump it in the kidneys? It goes out as urine. It goes out in the urine. So now how does the barn smell? What does the barn smell like when you got too much urea? You poultry guys can answer that question too. Swine guys can answer that question. It kind of smells like ammonia. And sometimes you know, I've been in poultry areas where I can't even hardly open my eyes. It's so strong. Well, this is an important point that crosses over from cows to poultry to, to, to swine. So it was very good at to reducing the ammonia level. In research, if you're below, if your p-value, statistical value, is less than 0 0.05, you can be written up in the Journal of Dairy Science or Beef Science or Poultry Science or whatever journal it is, because that's called statistically different. This number on the ammonia was less than 0 0.028. That is twice as strong as it needed to be to be written up in the journals. We haven't done that. I don't know how to write things for the journal. So I would have to hire somebody to do that for me. Also, it is a toxin binder. Um, North Carolina State University does a lot of research on toxin binding, whether it be with the charcoals, the clays, or the yeast products. And there are some areas that each of those are very, very effective in reducing toxins. And so the clay, Montmorillonite clay, is the only clay, there's lots of different clays, that they really research much. So there's Montmorillonite, there's zeolite, there's bentonite, there's um, smectite, there's there's like 10, 15 different types of clays that can come from volcanic ash. So when you look at Montmorillonite, it is flat um, in structure. So in other words, a particle would look like a business card as far as being flat. And the flat surface has a negative electrical charge. The ends have a positive, so which is more dominant in surface area? The flat side. So it's much more electrically charged to the negative than it is to the positive. And so that's how it functions as a toxin binder. If you look at zeolite, it looks like a chunk of Swiss cheese that's black. It has holes and things can pass through. And Tim will talk a little more about cation exchange capacity and so on. When it gets into soil, that's a bigger deal. But within animals, that cation exchange in the rumen and in the lower gut is the ability for these minerals to be more available to the animal. So when we go back to the liver biopsy, this can explain why those uh, bars didn't have anything on the negative side is because of the cation exchange capacity. But with the toxin binding, uh, that flat negative card has the ability to pull toxins. Aflatoxins, T2, xerilinones. Dr. Wishmeyer, when he sees vomitoxin, he takes a ribbon conditioner, gets it in the diet. And then cost-wise, uh, usually it's lower, but right now we have a problem. Uh, I don't like the exchange rate the way it is because it makes it harder for me to sell something. You guys don't like it because you have to pay more. So neither one of us really win. But like in the States, we are, uh, most places you go, we are actually, the conditioner costs less than sodium bicarb. So as we go through all this information, as far as whether it be um, the liver biopsies or whether it be the buffering capacity, toxin binding, uh, MUNs, these are all uh, scientific things that we've been able to show. We used to have a lot of anecdotal or testimonial comments, but we tried to find more science to help understand why this is all happening.
One more thing about minerals, this is about bioavailability and as you have those minerals around that, that circular wheel, there's lines going from calcium at basically 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock on that chart. You'll see lines going over to iodine or to magnesium from calcium. You'll see it going down to manganese. Uh, you'll see that line going from calcium to a lot of different minerals and so that means that calcium has a relationship with all those different minerals that those lines touch. And so there's a lot of connectivity. If you overdo one mineral, you can block the, the absorption of other minerals. And so that's why it's important to get the right balance. So we have a lot of bio, bioavailability because of cation exchangeability, but also the relationship between these have already more or less been pre-balanced like we talked about human blood versus ocean water. But the other thing is, is the form of mineral is very, very important. If you take rock mineral and crush it, uh, a low percentage of that actually is able to be absorbed into the tissues. So you can have rock minerals, uh, then you can have, here it says colloidal, the bottom one, that is like what's in plants. But the most available one is in crystalline. How many of you ever given a cow an IV? She has milk fever, she's down, she can't get up, her muscles are locked up and you give her a bottle, how long does it take for those minerals in that bottle to start to make an effect in the body? When do you start to see those muscles start to loosen up and she can get off the ground? How long does it take? Five minutes, 10 minutes, five hours, 15 minutes? Doesn't take very long, does it? Yes, that's an IV. But those minerals in that bottle that you're giving her in are, are in a crystalline form. In other words, they can go into solution in water. The minerals in the Redmond salt are crystalline. They will go into solution within minutes. There's only one, the Redmond salt has kind of a reddish or pinkish color to it. That is an iron oxide. In Utah, we have a lot of red rock or red dirt soil. Excuse me, Tim. We have a lot of red soil. Maybe you want to call that red stuff dirt. I'm not sure. But um, that iron oxide does not dissolve. So if you take the stuff for the home, the house use, the Redmond salt, and you put that in a glass of water and swish it around, you'll see that it goes into solution very quickly other than the reddish stuff. And so that's the only thing that is not in a crystalline form of the 60-some minerals. So the bioavailability is very, very important as far as quality of mineral. If you go take a lot of, if you go take a piece of a lot of uh, salt block, I mean ones that have minerals added to it, not just the sodium chloride ones, if you take those and just put them in, take a chunk and drop it in water, you'll see that a lot of those minerals never dissolve. And that's because they are in an oxide form. When we go back to talking a little bit about aflatoxins, this is uh, North Carolina State University and that graph represents cows that are fed aflatoxins and then they measure how much of that aflatoxin ends up in the milk. If you end up with over five parts per billion of aflatoxin in the milk in the states, your milk is condemned, you cannot sell it. So we have a lot of people when they are harvesting corn or whatever, if it's got aflatoxins in it, it's a real trouble situation. So certain times with growing conditions, there's a lot of aflatoxins in, in cotton seed or corn or whatever it may be. And so it becomes a problem for the milk. So when you start to feed aflatoxins, you can see the light blue, the ones that don't have clay added to it go up to a 0.7. And the ones with clay only go up to a 0.4. And when you stop feeding the, the toxin, you can see how fast it drops. But the overall message is that when you have feed with aflatoxins in it, you can see that when you feed clay, you only end up with about half as much aflatoxin in the milk as you do if you don't have clay. And so it shows its ability actually on a milk side of how much uh, reduction there is. When we do actual absorption tests and we send these off to independent labs, aflatoxin, we have a 99.2 absorption rate. And that was, a, I believe, 6.5 pH. 
T2 is about 86%, Zerillon 41%. Uh, those are the only three we tested. I wish we would have tested Zerillon just for curiosity's sake to see where that came because Dr. Wishmeyer likes to use it when he sees that. So the Redman conditioner not only works for the dairy cows on the right, but it can work for a lot of other different species. And so we'll now shift gears a little bit. Oh, one little part here, cost-wise. Um, this is for, uh, in the States, it's kind of typical that people will be paying anywhere from $600 to $1,200 per ton for mineral, and they usually feed about a pound per day. And so if we look at that blue side, um, that would be a typical mineral program, and they feed a feeding rate at one pound per cow per day, so it's costing about 30 cents per cow. So on 100 cows, it'd be costing about uh, $30 a day, or about $10,000, $11,000 per year for mineral. On the Redmond program, um, I did this as if we were shipping it clear from Utah, clear to the East Coast. Um, the freight would be $200 a ton to get it back to New Jersey. And right now with lower fuel prices, we can do a little better than that. But total cost 382, cost per pound 19 cents, with feeding rate of three quarters of a pound, costing 14 cents, so it's basically half the money. Now that varies depending on where you're at, and of course we have the Canadian exchange rate on the dollar and stuff that affects that, but a lot of people save quite a bit of money on the Redmond program. There's uh, various ways that you can actually feed the Redmond product. Um, the first one is you just take the Redmond sea salt and remove the other salt out of the diet and replace it ounce for ounce, gram for gram. And that's a very simple way of doing that. You can feed the Redmond salt and the conditioner. Simply take out the other salts and take out the sodium bicarb and replace that sodium bicarb ounce for ounce. Uh, which is normally somewhere between four to eight ounces of bicarb per cow per day, depending on whether it's summer or winter. And that's a very simple way of doing things. We do mix uh, the Redmond salt and conditioner into a 50-50 blend. We call that an SR50. We also have one called SR65, which is a 12 ounce feeding rate, which means that there's twice as much conditioner as there is salt. And so you can uh, take things out of the diet. Some people, because of economics, that's the only thing they'll feed. Other people like to keep selenium, iodine, a few other things bumped up in the diet, cobalt, mag manganese, uh, and so on. But you can go to whatever level you want to work with this. If you just want to replace salt, you can take that salt out, put this in. If you want to do salt and bicarb, you can do that. If you want to replace more and more, you can do that, work with your nutritionist. And uh, they can be in contact with me and I can kind of help coach that process. So now we'll shift to a different species. Before we do that, any questions on dairy that any of you have? We'll be hanging around, so you can always find me and ask questions personally if you'd like also.